say that it's part of our research, which is solar wind turbulence and why turbulence has tend to do with anything. Right? And um, so I will also give you a more uh, little bit of date on, on, on facts about Parker Solar Pro and uh, how it uh, will help us understand uh, the solar wind and turbulence. And I will then uh, go into a little bit more detail of uh, our recent research and, and the various uh, scenarios that we are trying to uh, uh, understand important problems which are objective of Parker Solar Pro. Uh, so I will separate it between uh, before Parker Solar Pro, what we have been doing, and now what will be different in the Parker Solar Pro era. Okay? And then I will conclude. So first, a little bit motivation. Uh, you see, we really like to look at the stars in, in the beautiful night sky, right? And it inspires a lot of people to look at the stars. At the stars. They are beautiful. Um, however, uh, there is a star that is more precious to us, uh, which is probably not as popular as many others. Uh, our sun gives us light, uh, essentially keeps us in the right orbit and provides energy that is needed to power many natural processes that uh, maintain life on Earth. Like the sun powers everything in our life. And um, so my aim in this lecture is, is, is all about convincing you why this uh, star is uh, actually more important and we need to pay more attention to it. So, and how Piper Solar Pro will lead the way to understanding the sun more than ever before. So the Piper Solar Pro is uh, uh, funded under the NASA Living with a Star program. Uh, this uh, mission is essentially going to get as close as we have ever been to the sun. And it will revolutionize our understanding. So in the next several years, you probably have already seen uh, a few press releases uh, every time Parker Solar Probe achieves a milestone. So it will continue breaking through uh, in many, uh, for many years. So Parker Solar Probe will travel through the sun, to the sun, sun atmosphere, like the other missions have done this before. And uh, it's actually, in some sense, you can see it as humanity's first opportunity to see a star up close, right? So the only star we can, with current technology, see up close. Now, but the question would be, why are we going to embark in such an ambitious project? Why do we need to visit the sun? Well, the sun is important. It provides energy that powers processes that to support life on Earth. Also, something that, that the first one you know, you knew, right? So the second one is not so widely you known, but in the planetary space, we think of it as vacuum, right? And if you compare it by the human standards, I mean, on Earth, you can do any vacuum on Earth. Uh, Interplanetary space is way better than any vacuum that we can make. But still, is filled with matter, with very, very, very low density, very faint uh, gas, but it's not empty. So interplanetary space is filled with solar wind. Uh, it's a continuous flow of charged particles, which we call a plasma, uh, originating in the solar atmosphere. A plasma is uh, essentially the fourth state of matter. Right? It seems like we learned that there are three states of matter, but then there is a fourth, right? And the fourth state of matter, you say, okay, that's exotic state. It turns out that yes, on Earth it's an exotic state, but uh, in the universe it's actually the most prevalent state of visible matter. Uh, all stars are made of plasma, and the space in between is made of plasma. And so the solar wind, this wind, interacts and shapes the planetary atmosphere uh, of every planet it encounters in the solar, wind, in the, in the solar system. Right? Also, the solar wind, this solar wind provides a special uh, link that controls the, what is called the space weather. The same way we try to predict hurricanes, right? Uh, a hurricane type of event can happen in the sun and propagate through the interplanetary space, in, through the solar wind, and then affect our atmosphere. And if, if the atmosphere is affected, right, then we have a, a weather event, right? So that's called space weather. The, the weather of the atmosphere above the ionosphere, when the, the atmosphere becomes uh, uh, electrically charged. Now, modern society is increasingly dependent on space and ground-based technology, right? And this space technology, and most of also ground-based technology, can be adversely affected by space weather. And it has happened in the past. So, uh, OK, 
occasionally and quite often, uh, millions of tons of highly magnetized material can erupt from the sun and uh, fly toward the Earth and toward the, the planet uh, at millions of miles per hour and affect the Earth's atmosphere and also its uh, space, our space assets. So the objective of the solar probe is to understand uh, the what causes the solar wind and therefore uh, help us increase our ability to forecast this uh, weather event. One thing that you need to have in mind is Parker Solar Probe is designed for fundamental physics, right? So we want to understand the physics that govern the solar wind. Once we understand the physics, we can get a better understanding of how weather events can happen, right? It's not directly going to be predicting the weather. Uh, it's just to help us understand uh, the first stage, understand the physics, to understand later the uh, space weather. Now, what's space weather? Well, uh, the sun uh, uh, spews uh, this wind, this wind, throughout the interplanetary space, in creating a huge bubble that is called the heliosphere. So all the planets are immersed in this bubble, uh, including Earth. Right. So when something happens on the sun, it propagates through space and then reaches us, and that can uh, that can lead to uh, radiation uh, for astronauts that are in, in uh, near Earth of Earth's orbit. Um, it can also, a solar flare can uh, disrupt communication, can actually, uh, dis you know, uh, amazingly, the magnetic field of the sun and the magnetic field of Earth are connected through this uh, plasma. And when something happens, it shakes up the magnetic field. And something that in physics that you learn, in basic physics in high school, is that when magnetic field is changing, currents are produced, right? And then suddenly you can have a power uh, station where currents or power lines where currents are induced out of nowhere. It's because the magnetic field of Earth is changing so rapidly that it can actually fry a uh, power plant, right? And then there can be a blackout. Also, it, uh, many of the communication navigation systems that we use are based on certain conditions of the atmosphere that if they're changed, then you will no longer have available a like GPA and so on, right? So space weather is extremely important. Like it, it's just that the space weather is, is not something that will bring down uh, a building or a house, right? It's just, um, it will affect technology. That's why probably space weather events that happened many centuries ago didn't matter because we didn't have anything in space. Uh, so uh, also another effect that I forgot to mention that is also important in the day-to-day -day basis is that when you fly on an airplane, you're actually receiving radiation, right? So when a solar event happens, it may increase, substantially increase the radiation that passengers receive. And actually sometimes when uh, uh, there is solar activity, some flights are rerouted to avoid uh, this uh, extra radiation. So you can get actually like a hundred x-rays in, in, one, in one flight during uh, a storm, what they call geomagnetic storm. So now, let us uh, learn next a little bit about the solar probe uh, spacecraft, right? So, and why it's called Parker solar probe. So, this uh, mission was launched uh, almost a year, a little bit more than three years ago, uh, from Kennedy Space Center, um, uh, in the most powerful rocket that we can have, we will have, right? And the reason why is that it comes in intuitive, but if we want to send a spacecraft or, or, or some uh, satellite outside of the solar system, right? let's say we want to send us, we already have one Voyager already left the solar system, but if we want to do that, the energy required to do that is less than sending something to the sun, right? So actually it requires very powerful, and you need a lot of energy to drop something into the sun. And the main reason is because we're uh, orbiting uh, the sun at a very high speed. So if you want something to fall to the sun, right, you need to slow it down. So we, we're going way too fast. We need to slow it down too much to make it fall closer to the sun, right? So here is Eugene Park with Nikki Fox, uh, then mission director of the Parker Solar Probe. She's now uh, in a, a, a different position that is uh, higher up, and, uh, and Parker, it's right there. Parker, this mission bears his name, as we will see later, uh, is the first person uh, to, uh, who's uh, having uh, his name in a mission while he's alive. So he's the only one that has been able to see a mission being launched with his name. And uh, he's still alive. And uh, the reason why uh, it's called Parker Solar Probe is that he was the person that uh, proposed the existence of the solar wind and created an entire new field, in, which is called geophysics. And he, uh, he, he did that by himself, single-handed. 
So he wrote the paper, nobody believed him, and they didn't want to accept the paper, and he insisted. And then uh, he created this entire seal. So his name is on the paper, and uh, so very uh, to honor his contribution. That's one of the, his many con contributions. So this is the spacecraft, uh, just so that you can see, compared to one person. Uh, it's more or less like a school bus, a little bit of the size of a school bus. And here are uh, the instruments. Right? So I'm just going to briefly mention uh, the instruments so that you, you know what kind of uh, things we're interested in uh, or this, this spacecraft is going to measure. It has uh, antennas to measure electric fields. It has an on, uh, another antennas and probes to measure magnetic fields. So a plasma has magnetic and electric field. And it also has uh, uh, this material as the antenna. And then here it has uh, something that's called a Faraday cup. Uh, this Faraday cup essentially is a, a sensor that is collecting charged particles and then discriminating their velocities and, and their properties to uh, get an understanding of the plasma. Right? So it also has uh, important uh, thermal shield protector, right? So this is thermal shield is um, designed to withstand the temperatures that uh, the spectrum uh, will experience when it's going close to the sun. So this will have to be perfectly aligned so that it, it, it's facing um, the sun. And then the instruments behind are uh, protected, okay? Also the solar panels, right? Solar panels are very uh, important uh, cooling systems because they get really hot. So, and, but you see, they're getting so close to the sun, it doesn't make much sense or it's actually not possible to look directly at it. So the, the images that it has, it has coronal uh, wildlife images that are to the side, right? So the space that is orbiting around the sun and then you can see uh, to the side where it's going, right? And you can see uh, images of plasma. Or, or 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 whatever is happening on the side, right? So you have a, a, a side where it's going and a side from where it's coming, right? So it's, you can see both sides. Okay, so this is uh, part of the probe orbit and current uh, position, right? This is as of today. And uh, when it was launched from Earth, right? So you saw that in order to fall, you see, the spacecraft has to fall into the sun, right? To make it closer, so the way it, this is made is that you launch the spectra so that it, it kills some of the velocity that Earth has. So then it starts falling, right? But then the turns out that it's not going to be enough. Uh, we don't have enough power to, to make it fall that way. So then uh, in the first part of the trajectory, it encountered Venus to use what is called a gravity assist to slow down the spectra a little bit more and then uh, undergo the first trajectory, the first orbit, right? So then it goes around and then Venus goes by its, uh, uh, its way, right, around the sun again. And then, um, you see, it remains in the elliptical orbit. So in order to make it go closer, you need to have a second encounter with Venus. So it goes again with Venus to slow down and get closer. Right? That's, that's where you see the orbit progressively uh, getting closer and closer to the sun. So the, the yellow line is the past, and the red lines are the future. And you can see it's going to get very, very close. But in order, it's going to do that progressively by getting slow down every time it goes by Venus. Like it, it just did a, 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 a Venus flyby a few weeks ago. So now, cool fact about Parker Solar Probe. At closest approach, Parker Solar Probe will fly around the sun approximately at 430,000 miles per hour. That's as fast as we, uh, any, no, no other human instrument or, or, or device has flown uh, not anywhere close to that. And uh, I guess the previous record was by the spacecraft that went uh, close also, but not as close, right? So at this velocity, you can go from New York to Tokyo in one minute. Okay, now, when the spacecraft reaches closest approach in 2024, uh, after several gravity assists from Venus, it will, uh, the thermal protection shield will have to withstand temperatures up to 2,500 Fahrenheit. And the gold melts at 2000, about 2,500, right? So this has to withstand very high temperatures. While the spacecraft instruments just behind the shadow are at comfortable 85 Fahrenheit. Now, on the final three orbits, right, the solar probe will fly approximately at uh, 3.8 million miles from the sun's surface, right? That seems like a lot of miles, right? But it's not, not so much, like right? there are 
93 million miles uh, between the center of the sun and the earth. Right? So that's very close. Now, um, the previous record holder was a Helios mission, which uh, went uh, up to 27 miles close to the sun, but that was back in the 1970s and 80s. Right? So um, now, let's try to make a baseball, baseball analogy and, and see uh, where this is, uh, uh, how close it's going to get. Right? So if the, part, if the sun is at the home plate and uh, the earth is at the center here, all the way at the wall right here, and the sun here, right? Parker Solar Pro will be at the batter box, at the edge of the batter box, right, right at this line. So it will be right there, right? very, very close. Uh, so this is, by the way, minus made part. Uh, I took this, uh, uh, I gave a similar seminar uh, when Houston uh, asked us they were going for the World Series. Right? So now, uh, from now on, I'm going to talk a little bit about why do we have to go to the sun and why do we have to uh, what is the relevance of this mission? But something I forgot to mention is that going this close to the sun has been a uh, uh, top priority for NASA since uh, NASA was founded. So project proposals for a solar probe of some kind were in the making, and there were many proposals, many orbits. And uh, it was finally made possible by uh, technological advances uh, in this decade. Right? And But now, the main uh, purpose of Parker Solar Probe is to understand why, uh, uh, why there is solar wind. Uh, I'm going to go into more detail. Uh, but for, for that, let's talk about first what is the solar wind. Well, the solar wind, as I mentioned before, is a continuous radial outflow of plasma that uh, originates uh, in the sun, in the solar atmosphere, and pervades the solar system. And uh, these, we know, arises uh, because you know, like planets, they have atmospheres and stars, and then uh, the atmosphere, which is the, ma the, the material that is in the above the surface, right, is normally uh, uh, maintained by the gravit gravitational pull of the planet or the star, right? So here, it turns out that the gravitational force of the sun, which is very, very high, uh, if you want to have an idea, right, the sun's mass is more than 99% of the total mass in the solar system. So we are nothing, like. Right? more than 99% of the solar system is the sun. So the gravitational force of the sun is tremendous, right? And uh, for instance, in Earth, if you want to escape Earth, you have to, uh, in the rocket, you have to be moving at 11 kilometers per second. And uh, on the sun, you need to move at 600 kilometers per second. So it's much faster than you need to move uh, to get out. So then how is this atmosphere getting out? Well, the key to this atmosphere getting out of the gravitational force is the million degree corona. Now, the big question is, how does this happen? In, 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 how is this physically possible? How can this uh, overcome this tremendous attraction by the sun? I will try to explain this um, as we go, right? So, bear with me. So, let's try to understand a little bit more about the solar wind. The, 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 the properties, what are the properties of this wind? Uh, uh, near the Earth. The Earth is approximately at one astronomical unit, which by definition is the average distance from the Sun to the Earth, right? So near the Earth, which is about 93 million miles from the Sun, uh, the, the uh, solar wind, solar wind is matter, it's made of charged particles, right? Proton, uh, helium, that are ionized, and then electrons, right? This matter is, uh, at a very high temperature level. For a plasma, 180,000 Fahrenheit is not too hot, but I mean, for our standards, it's hot, right? So it, it, it's a hot uh, matter in a hot state for Earth standards, right? So, and it's also thin. It's just 80 particles per cubic inch. Even if you create the best vacuum with the best technology on Earth, you cannot get that low, that empty. Okay? Now, the wind can be classified roughly in three times. It's a wind, so it's blown. Right, so uh, this this wind has uh, three main types of wind. Like roughly, can be characterized in three types of wind. One is called the fast wind, and of course, it's because it's moving faster. And the speed at which this wind is moving is 1.5 million to 2 million miles per hour. 
when you compare this to a hurricane, right? Uh, this is like a, an amazingly fast wind. Right? How can this be? Now, the basic state, uh, this fast wind is sometimes considered the basic state of the flow. And this happens normally during solar minimum. The, mid, the sun goes cycles of activity, low activity, high activity. When there's low activity, it's called solar minimum. So then this wind is a little bit quieter, it's like more steady. Right? Now there is another wind which is slow, uh, it's moving slower. It's a uh, half a million miles per hour to one million miles per hour. It's normally confined to la low latitudes, like near the equator of the sun. Right? And it originates, when well, it's solar maximum, it originates from everywhere. Right? Now, there is also what is called the transient solar wind. Transient solar wind is when something happens on the solar surface, that perturbation or disturbance propagates to the solar wind, and then you can see in the spectra that some sort of unusual signal that it's not salt, not fast, or not slow, right? So that's a transient solar wind associated to coronal mass ejections or flare. Now, one thing that you need to know, uh, we have been too technical about plasma physics or pari charged particles moving in a magnetic field, is that particles moving, uh, charged particles moving in a magnetic field, they behave like beads on a wire, right? So they can easily move along the wire, but they have a very difficult time moving around. So it's like they're attached to the, to the field, magnetic field line. So if there is a magnetic field line, then the particles will be confined to that line. And uh, therefore, if these particles are spewing out, they have to be moving mostly along field lines, right? And then they, they have to come, if they reach Earth, they have to be coming from a magnetic field line that is open, that is anchored at the sun, and then open into the planetary space. Right. So, the solar wind originates in the corona. So, the, the sun, uh, the sun's atmosphere, the sun produces a magnetic field, and therefore the atmosphere is permeated by this magnetic field. So, this picture uh, shows the corona. So, normally you cannot see the corona with a uh, telescope because the disk of the sun uh, will is so uh, intense, like the light is so intense that it, it uh, overshadows the, the corona. So, when there is an eclipse, a good opportunity to see the corona. And you can see here, in the light emission of this, uh, uh, that's coming from the sun, you can see that there are fine lines that thread the atmosphere, right? And the lines are mostly uh, smooth and coming out of the polar region, so this is the, the North Pole and the South Pole. And then in the equatorial region, they are more cluster and more uh, random looking, right? And actually, this, this region is dominated by sea lines that if they go out of the surface and then return to the surface, like they're called closed loops. And these lines, normally they go out and then they continue inter into interplanetary space. Right? So that's why most of the wind is coming from uh, open field lines, because if the field line is open, then the, 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 the matter can flow through it very easily. Now, you have seen these striking pictures of, 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 of coronal uh, flares, like solar flares, right? So you see this arc that is very uh, amazing. So you see this very intense uh, uh, emission of light, and then that is connected to both uh, at both points on the surface. But right? that plasma material that is hot and trapped by this magnetic field line because it doesn't have a way to go out. Sometimes one of these ends snaps and opens into the interplanetary space, and then ejects this material out into the into space. Right. So that's intuitively how you can see how this plasma can uh, leave the sun, only if the magnetic field lines are open, okay? Now, this uh, uh, picture in the right hand side is a complicated picture, but all, uh, it's a measurement by a spacecraft called Ulysses that went, underwent an orbit that includes the north, the, the north pole and the south pole of the sun, and it measured the velocity of the wind, right? So, in this plot, all you have to know is that red is the north pole, blue is the south pole, and uh, also, the distance from the center of this cross to here tells you the speed of the wind. Right? So you can see that in the polar region, the wind is higher than in the equatorial region, right? Because the distance here is closer. Right? So this is not distance; it's just uh, a measure of velocity, right? But here it's just qualitatively telling you that the velocity here is lower than here. So wind, this is during solar minimum. Wind is low, mostly from equatorial regions, and wind is fast, are fast from polar regions. This is on solar minimum. The sun is very nice and behaves. But when it's in solar maximum, then it's very uh, uh, turbulent, and then you will have uh, this figure will be more uh, less uh, clear than here. Right? I didn't want to show it uh, because it's not necessary. 
Now, uh, Pastor uh, suggested the Christians of the solar wind. How this came about? At the time, right, the only model for the solar atmosphere was typical model for an atmosphere, right? So you assume that the atmosphere is, is, uh, re remains uh, static, right? And uh, essentially, every layer of the atmosphere, uh, which is a weight, is, uh, that weight is balanced perfectly by the uh, pressure of the gas. Uh, the atmosphere, like on Earth, right? So you know that the pressure drops with distance. Um, and that's what makes the, the, the atmosphere to be static, right? So Chapman in 1957, he, he assumed that. But then it turns out that Parker in 58 discovered that uh, this uh, atmosphere cannot remain in static equilibrium because to remain in static equilibrium, the interstellar pressure, uh, which is where the solar system is contained, right? So uh, it's so low that it cannot contain it. Like if the pressure from the sun is too high, so it, uh, the, the atmosphere wants to go out. Right? So then the gravitational pull cannot counteract the pressure uh, of, the, of the million degree corona, and therefore the, the atmosphere expands. And that's what produces solar wind. So the atmosphere of the sun expands. So when we feel the wind here, we are actually feeling part of the atmosphere of the sun that is expanding to lower us. So Parker assumed, uh, instead uh, uh, of assuming a hydrostatic corona, he assumed a hydrodynamic corona, dynamic because it moves, and then he found with wind solutions that were later, four years later, discovered. You, can, you could actually measure the wind, even though nobody believed him when he introduced it. So one shortcoming of his model, which is very simple, he, he got the main idea, but it, it was very simple. Uh, he used the temperature observing the corona, and he found that uh, he could only explain the slow wind, but no, no matter how you did his model, uh, he still couldn't produce a fast wind, only slow. So then there was uh, uh, the hypothesis that then there is a need, there needs to be an additional uh, source of energy that feeds the corona and pushes the wind out faster. Okay, so the outstanding science questions ever seen uh, is. Still, why the corona is so much harder than the, than the photosphere, which is the surface of the sun, and how is the solar wind accelerated? How this process happens? Like, all we're doing so far is we measure far from the sun by looking at the sun with telescopes in space or or in the ground, and also with satellites. But satellites don't get all the way to the sun. Right? So we're sort of what we see from here, right? We try to understand why this happened, right? but Parker Solar Probe will help us because we will measure right there. So how do we benefit from answering this question? Right? Well, there is a scientific benefit, right? So we, I mean, because we make a li we, uh, our living is to understand these things, like we're very happy. The Parker Solar Probe is there. I have been waiting for, since I'm in the field, I have been waiting for this to happen. So we will have a greater understanding of the fundamental features of the sun, the heliosphere, and the planet. Technological. So by learning this fundamental physics, then we will be able to improve satellite communication, uh, our safety issues, radiation exposure on airline flights, and astronaut safety, because once we understand space weather, we can control these things, right? So, but then there is still the societal benefit. Human progress or civilization is strongly dependent on space technology right now, and it will continue doing so, right? So then space weather can impact our technology uh, because of the complex on Earth interaction. So because of that, we have to care about this question, right? So this question seems academic, and they seem like, why do we care that the solar corona is hot? Well, it turns out it's very important, because if the corona wasn't like it is, right, there wouldn't be even life on Earth, right? So we need to understand this issue, and it's fundamental to our uh, also progress. So now, why should we study the solar wind? As I said, it's the extension of the solar corona, and pervade the, the, the heliosphere. Um, it's the backdrop of immediate solar interaction between sun and the earth, as affecting uh, regulating space weather. And um, as such, uh, uh, space weather events can uh, impact our grid, the International Space Station, and so on. Now, the main reason, uh, yeah, this is all nice and good, but the main reason why I like studying uh, uh, solar wind and particle approach is because the solar wind is absolutely the best laboratory to study plasma physics, right? The plasma is there for you to measure. Now, the, what, another topic that is important in this talk that I wanted to discuss is that uh, to answer these two questions, 
many, there are many theories, there are many models, but many, the models are not constrained enough by what we know in terms of experiments, observations. So, but uh, among the leading theories that have been developed to explain why the corona is hot and the corona will accelerate, um, rely on a very familiar phenomenon that we see on Earth, and which and can have the key to answering both questions, which is turbulence. Right? So, turbulence is a complicated subject. I will try to make it as uh, intuitive as possible. Uh, and uh, but it's actually a very exciting topic, and amazingly, you see turbulence all the time. It's just that maybe you're not even aware of the turbulence around you. So, for that, then we ask, what is turbulence? Turbulence, loosely defined, is a very complex state of a fluid motion, like fluid, like a liquid or a gas, right? A gas or a, or, or a liquid can be considered fluid in some form, right? So, the turbulence is a state of motion that is irregular and unpredictable and involves a large number of, 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 of scales or, or modes of, of, of motion, right? That are interacting in very crazy ways. For instance, when you uh, go, turbulence is around us, right? So when you run, air around you becomes turbulent. You leave a wake of turbulence. When you are driving, you also leave a wake of turbulence, and the turbulence actually drags. I mean, if they are driving your car, and then engineers have to design the car aerodynamics so that this drag is small. Uh, when you cook, you have to mix stuff, and normally turbulence is very effective for mixing. For instance, when you put milk in your coffee, you produce turbulence to mix uh, the, and make uh, a latte, right? And also when you fly, right? So you have to fasten your seatbelt because the air, normally when you're flying in a smooth air, right, the, 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 the flow is called laminar. It's flowing over the wings in a very steady way, not random, very uh, steady way that you are flying smooth and suddenly, it becomes irregular, and then that's why the plane shape, right? So, and as, as it happens in air, when you're flying, uh, these are neutral fluids. They're not, the, this, the air is not made of, of electrically charged particles, it's made of neutral particles, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, which are neutral atoms. So, matter in, in gaseous state or liquid state can be understood in, on Earth very easily because uh, gases and liquids are abundant and they are at normal temperature that you can actually control, right? So you can control the experiment very well. But this turbulence also happens in even hotter uh, systems, like uh, in which the gas is so hot that uh, atoms can no longer be neutral, then they are ripped off of the electrons, and then you have a, a gas of a mixture of electrically positively charged particles and negatively charged uh, particles, electrons. And, and this uh, electrically charged uh, gas can now easily conduct electricity and also make the dynamics a lot more complicated and also have turbulence. The issue is that plasmas are not so common on Earth and it's very, uh, any plasma experiment is very expensive. You have to have big facilities, big uh, state-of-the-art equipment to produce plasma. But, oh, some, you can actually have cooler plasmas that you can uh, you're more familiar with, like a neon uh, ball, right? So you see that is a plasma inside uh, that is glowing. And, um, but like laboratory grade plasma are, are, are very hot. They require a lot of technology, right? The problem with turbulence is that there is little analytical, when I mean analytically, mathematically, solving the questions are tremendously complicated. Very, very difficult. It, it, no one knows how to solve exactly the problem. Uh, in, a, in an exact form because there are no mathematical methods for doing that. So therefore, we normally re uh, use simulations uh, and experiments to test uh, turbulence theories based on speculation, right? So the takeaway message that I want you to get is that right now it's a very good time to in uh, do solar with turbulence because Parker Solar Pro will be the leading the way for this discovery. Now, the other takeaway is that the ho from these details that I discussed, the solar corona is hundreds of times hotter than the solar star. That's an counterintuitive. The sun is hot. If you go farther, it gets hotter, right? It shouldn't be. It should, it should get um, uh, hotter as you get closer, not farther, right? So that's something supposed. Why, as you go away from the sun, it gets hotter? I mean, it gets hotter for some time, and then it starts to drop the temperature. But still, there is a region where the temperature goes high, a very high, hundreds of times higher as you go away from the sun. This is something that is not yet explained. And that the... Uh, the gravitational force of the sun cannot contain the atmosphere and then it expands. The solar wind uh, emanates from open field lines on the surface. 
and that there is a fast wind that normally comes from the polar regions and a slow wind that comes from equatorial regions. Another thing that has been observed is that the solar wind is undisputable turbulence. Like it's like uh, the solar wind is turbulent like the, the air on the wings when you are experiencing turbulence uh, is con all the time turbulent. It's never in this uh, steady state where it's always undergoing shaking. Right? It's like relatively unpredictable abandon. Right? So it's undergoing this behavior, turbulent behavior. Now. What do we know about solar wind turbulence before past the solar probe? So, uh, I'm going to talk about turbulence before past the solar probe, uh, and then I'm going to briefly explain how do we understand turbulence, right? So, um, this is a, a, a complicated uh, slide, so don't panic. So, I have an equation, right? Uh, and I write the equation on purpose, because this is a very important equation. You will win a million dollars if you show that this equation has solution. Right, so this is the famous navier stokes equation. And uh, you don't need to understand it. I am trying to understand it myself. Uh, it's doing this research because our equations are even more complicated than those. And uh, we don't know how to solve them. Uh, with pen and paper, we need to use computers, right? So, but the main features and physical aspects of this equation can be understood in a very easy way. So, when you, uh, uh, turbulence is characterized by motion over many, many cycles. Right, so imagine you have a sea of motions that are big, so like waves that are big and waves that are small of all sizes, right? So it turns out that if you produce waves or, or motions of blocks, for instance, on a cup of coffee, right, that uh, block, if you put a drop of milk, it will remain there, right? And then slowly diffuse until it makes the coffee uh, brown. But if you shake it up with a spoon, right, you actually effectively mix uh, the block by producing, especially what is happening, you break up the drop into smaller drops and so on until uh, you have motion of, on all, of all sizes, right? So qualitatively, uh, this uh, blue uh, in the equation means this is where you put the energy. You put the energy in motion of certain size. And then what is characteristic about the system is that the energy that you put has to go away. And but it doesn't go away at the same time, at the same scale, at the same size. It goes away when the motion is uh, of a smaller size let's say here in the green term, right? So because the energy is put in into this size and it's extracted into this uh, much smaller size, right? The block has to break up into smaller ones to get there, right? And that process is called a turbulence cascade, and that's what produces turbulence, right? So it, these are essential ingredients for turbulence. It's essentially acceleration dissipation. This block will not dissipate unless there is turbulence, right? When there is turbulence, it breaks up and then becomes smaller and smaller and small until there is sufficiently small scale that the energy can be taken out of the system, right? So that's all we need to know. Uh, in hydrodynamics, there is an energy cascade, a chain of blocks or eddies that are breaking up into smaller ones and transfer the energy from large motion to small motion, right? So, and, this, and because the large eddies cannot dissipate the energy, right? They break up until they are small enough to dissipate it. Right. So that's, that's typical of what happened in any, in any turbulent system. Right. So now, how does this work in, in, in plasma? In plasma, there is a generalization of the magnetic stock equation, which is called magneto hydrodynamics. And what happens is that it's called magneto because it has magnetic field. Now, what happens in the magneto case that uh, uh, extends more beyond what is in the hydrodynamic case is that the plasma supports various waves. Like waves, like the waves on a on a string, or right when you have a rope and you shake it, you produce a wave, right? So this the magnetic field behaves like a rope that you can shake, and then when you shake it, right, you produce a wave that propagates through the rope, and that happens in 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 a plasma. Plasma has a magnetic field line that can be behave like a string, and now, uh, in addition to this wave, which of course be, of, uh, because you are uh, shaking the the, the string. A similar wave, similar waves can arise also in another fashion, similar to the sound wave. Sound waves, I can't speak for you because this, uh, the air, I'm compressing and decompressing the air right, through my vocal cord, and then I produce a wave that is a special wave. The other waves are special waves. And the important one that I'm going to focus today is what's called the alpine wave. The alpine wave is associated to, uh, associated with um, shaking of magnetic right? So, for instance, one characteristic of this wave is that they can only produce uh, turbulence 
if they or, or it's the equivalent to shaking of your coffee if you have the two waves coming toward one another. Right? So this is a simulation where you have two nice waves which are very nice looking and when they cross each other, right, they break up and produce smaller scale motion. Right? Now when they reach the end they are going to encounter again because this is a periodic simulation. You see how it reach, how it breaks up again into even smaller motion, right? So this is essentially the steering of the coffee, right? So when the waves encounter one another, they steer themselves up and then break up into smaller ones. And then they can accelerate the dissipation, right? That they otherwise wouldn't have, right? Now, these simulations normally require very high supercomputers, very, very powerful supercomputers. The supercomputers that I show here are used for this type of simulation. And these, these computers have been replaced by even more powerful ones, right? Here we use 100,000 uh, processors uh, in parallel to simulate this thing. And if you keep smashing this uh, wave one uh, toward another, uh, you will produce a very turbulent state similar to the kind that you find in the solar wind. Right? So this is what the turbulence will look like if you collide many, many of those waves. Okay? Now, the takeaway messages that I want you to, to have is that uh, some of these are what, technical and complicated, but what we need to know is that turbulence in the solar wind, I mean, it's everywhere in the solar wind. Uh, everywhere we have measured. Uh, solar wind has been uh, seen to have alpha waves, right? And alpha wave turbulence becomes more complicated than hydrodynamic turbulence that we can uh, use in neutral fluid. And um, so far, most observations have been consistent with a tiny type of turbulence uh, far from the sun. The remaining question is, what happens closer to the sun? So, closer to the sun, uh, we have, this is the ultimate uh, role of turbulence in the heating of the corona, right? So, this wave that pro are produced by shaking and the steam ions, uh, in principle, are produced at the surface of the sun, and then they propagate out. Imagine that you have the motion on the surface is shaking these lines and producing waves that go out. This wave, they carry energy, and then if they are able to deposit that energy into the atmosphere, then they will heat the plasma and then explain why the flat corona is heated. That's one of the main theories. Uh, but we are trying to find evidence for that. So one one problem with this picture is that if the waves go out, they don't have a way to to uh, convert that energy into heat unless there is a counter propagating wave that produces turbulence, like I showed in the previous simulation, right? So you need a reflected wave that comes back and, and produces the turbulence, shakes up the wave, and dissipates in the corona. So that's the alpine wave turbulence scenario. Now, is there evidence of alpine waves in the corona? Yes. Here we have um, an, a video. I mean, it may be very difficult to see. I don't know over Zoom how you can see it, but this is a, a video of, of, of uh, remote observation of uh, the solar surface uh, the, at a certain the wavelength. Right? Don't, uh, all you have to see is that this is light coming from the corona, from a coronal hole, an open field line. And if you see this, the thin threads of magnetic lines, if you look at them closely, they are actually shaking back and forth. That is evidence of alpha waves. And when you try to identify the motion of this, you can actually characterize them by alpha waves. And when you calculate the energy they have when they propagate, that's enough energy to heat the corona. So that's uh, encouraging. Now, the problem is that waves going away are not enough to produce turbulence. You need to have waves coming back. And it turns out that there is a mechanism that produces waves coming back down to the sun. And then when they interact together, they produce the turbulence, right? And this turbulence that is induced by reflection is called reflection driven turbulence. Now, this is becoming a little bit uh, complicated, but the essence uh, of what we want to do is test the main, in, 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 in this report, is test the main science question, science question, which is, is this scenario viable? Can uh, alpha waves propagate away and return and produce turbulence in enough uh, fashion that uh, it can produce heating of the corona that is observed. To answer this question, we need measurements right there, which we will have, and then a better understanding of this turbulence that we are doing right now. Right? So here, I'm running out of time, so I want to sh show uh, a very cool code uh, that produces numerical simulations of this type of turbulence that shows the viability of this uh, scenario. And here we have uh, the sun, uh, and then we produce um, a geometry which is essentially like an open magnetic spin line that comes out of the sun and it's expanding as it goes out. 
and then we try to simulate what is happening inside that little tube. Okay? Now, for that, we need an even more powerful computer, and we use 1.5 million process right, in parallel. Well, that computer also is decommissioned, it's already obsolete, and has been replaced by a new one. Right? So uh, we use uh, this computer for that, and it's already gone. Right? There is a new one, it was dismantled uh, uh, last year. Now, this is a, a, a video, a cool video that shows uh, the results of the simulation. I hope you can see it, right? So here, this is the, the, the tube uh, on the left, is showing the waves that are going away, and on the right, you have the reflected waves, right? So what we do in this simulation is we produce similar type of waves that would be produced by this toy uh, in motion on the surface of the sun, and then we let the waves propagate by themselves let them reflect and see if they produce turbulence, right? And the turbulence is needed because when they produce turbulence, their energy can be uh, taken to sufficiently small scale where they can dissipate, right? And you can see on the plane inset, you can see the uh, very sort of like turbulent type of, 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 of the shaking, right? You can see here, this will be the shaking, right? So you see how it becomes structures of smaller sizes and that's where dissipation is taking place, right? So, but that's a, a plot that is, is good to show uh, visually what is happening, but it's not very quantitative, it's more qualitative. Here, uh, in this uh, plot, is a recent plot that we made based on simulation predicting some property of the, of the survey, and uh, the blue line is our best simulation that we have so far, the largest, and uh, if, um, we plot several different observations that we have made uh, remotely and with spacecraft and see how the simulation fare compared to the data. Right? And there is reasonable agreement with the data that we have so far. Right now, we're trying to make comparisons with measurements by Parker Solar Probe. Here in the right, you can see Ulysses it is, uh, and Helios. These are the ones that, uh, became, the Helios is the one that came as close as possible before Parker, right? We're going to be able to get even farther to make better comparisons, right? So, and that would be and in the end of my uh, talk, I know the end was a little bit more technical, but what uh, is essential uh, for, for you to, to take home is that turbulence is essentially like when you mix your coffee, that you put uh, uh, milk and then you stir it up with the spoon to make it homogeneous, right, to make it all brown, right? This is essentially the same. What we're trying to, the role that turbulence plays is essentially to shake up the waves so that they can convert that energy into heat in the, in the corona, right? And uh, so I conclude with a summary that understanding solar wind turbulence is critical to understanding uh, some planet interaction and to understand space weather. And um, very exciting times are coming uh, with this historic mission. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perez. Uh, I wish we could all applaud for you, but you're getting many thanks um, from the chat. Uh, I just want to, first of all, apologize. We had some issues at the beginning with the, the stream not starting, um, but thank you guys for sticking with us. Um, so you do have a few questions, so I'm gonna go ahead and read them aloud to you. Um, the first question is from Ramana. How was the interstellar pressure known when Parker published his results? Uh, it was based on estimates. It was just rough estimates uh, of what um, we had at the time. It is, it's not like a measurement, right? It's just an estimate based on what we observed uh, from uh, the scattering of light and so on. During the uh, okay, so really this is kind of confirming those estimates, hopefully, um, when we do these experiments, right? Uh, or get the, it is, yeah, the interstellar pressure is outside our helioscope, right? So uh, hopefully with Voyager, we will have a, a better, um, a more accurate uh, estimate of this pressure. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Brian Murphy. How do the magnetic field lines of the sun contribute to turbulence in the corona? Oh, actually, it's a, a very good question. That's essentially the, the essence of this, uh, what makes plasma uh, different from a fluid. So when the plasma has a magnetic field in it, 
uh, it gives a certain property to the plasma, which is the magnetic field becomes has certain elasticity, right? And that's what produces the wave, right? And uh, the magnetic field is actually the key ingredient to explaining why the corona may be hot. It's because there is a lot of energy on the surface of the sun. Like this plasma is is essentially like boiling on the surface, moving back and forth, right? and it contains a lot of energy, right? But because the magnetic field lines are in, uh, embedded in the plasma, right? They, they they move with the plasma, and then they are shaking. And because they are shaking, they take some of that energy up, and they propagate up. Right? The key here is that we need those waves, because they, those waves will continue moving all the way past Earth and so on. So we need some mechanism that makes them deposit the energy into the atmosphere and the turbulence is, is the key to answer one key to answering that question okay thank you so basically the magnetic fields are a, a key component in that transfer of energy and probably answering why the corona is getting heated up um, so the next question, um, before I read that aloud, I do want to encourage you guys, if you have any more questions, to please include them in the chat, um, and we'll go ahead and, and ask them to Dr. Perez. So the last question we have so far is from Ramana again. What creates the Alvin waves, or what's, the, I guess, the source of the Alvin waves? Uh, you mean in the sun? Um, yes, in yeah, the sun. Plasma motion on the solar surface. So if you see the solar, if you were to see these images from uh, ground-based telescope or space-based telescope uh, of the sun, you see that the solar surface is made of granules of plasma blobs that are emerge and uh, rise and, and and drop again uh, toward the in the convective zone. So this motion that is uh, actually turbulent, right, uh, has magnetic field lines uh, threading it, and uh, the, one of the properties as I. Uh, mentioned before that the plasma has is that these lines are like frozen to the plasma so they are uh, they move with the plasma so because this uh, motion is taking these lines they uh, they produce this wave like because in a plasma magnetic field behaves like a like a rope that has tension right so if you tense a rope and then you start shaking right you will produce a wave right the same exact analogy you see happens in the in the in the magnetic field, the magnetic field behaves pretty much like a like a rope, and when it's shaken, it will produce this wave. Okay, um, that's a that's a good analogy. Um, I I have a question. Um, you you mentioned the Navier-Stokes uh, equation, and you said it was famous. <laughs> yeah. You want to kind of tell us, give us a little background of why it's famous? Yeah, it's famous or infamous. Yeah, but I guess it's famous. I really. Uh, uh, because if you read uh, the Millennium Problem, um, and some movies, actually, some movies uh, talk about the Navier Stokes equation. Like, there was a movie where um, there was one scientist, uh, mathematician who devoted their life to, to uh, solve it and so on. So, it's actually uh, something we don't. The Navier Stokes equation is, is very simple physically, in the sense that. Uh, we know to understand if you if you ever took a physics one class or a physics class in high school, you learn uh, Newton's second law, which is four equal mass times per acceleration. Well, if you apply Newton's second law to a fluid to fluid matter, right, you get Navier-Stokes equation. And uh, with an additional assumption, which is that you cannot compress the fluid. Imagine water, like it's hard to compress it. Right, so then it behaves. That new Navier's Stokes equation is essentially S equal M A or four, four equal mass times acceleration, and and that describes the behavior of a fluid. And most engineers that design planes, cars, and everything, they use Navier's Stokes equation. But normally, you have to make certain approximations or use a numerical simulation to solve it because no mathematician has proven that that equation has solution. We believe it has solutions because it's a physical equation. If it is a physical equation, it describes the dynamics of a system. No matter how difficult it is, right, there must be a solution. Right? That is the key that in mathematics, there is no formal demonstration that the equation can be actually solved. But we nevertheless resolve it in approximately, numerically. Right? So, and um, given the proof that it has solutions, we'll give you a million dollars. 
All right, so for those of you out there that want a million dollars, you need to solve the Navier-Stokes theorem <laughs> equation. Yeah. Um, so we have another question, um, and basic. This is from Vamp, uh, Vamp Sith, and the question is, how are they shielding the Parker Solar Probe? That's interesting. Do you know if this is technology they've used in other um, satellites or, or spacecrafts? So like, for example, I know that James Webb is supposed to have a solar shield as well, but I'm, I'm assuming it doesn't need, need to deflect as much heat um, as this does. Yeah, I mean, this, this is, if, you, if you want to uh, make a, a scale analogy, if you have a meter long stick, right, so, and you put the Earth on one end, uh, and I'm uh, the, the, the telescope is more or less uh, close to Earth, right? It's one AU. So imagine you are one meter away in, in this case, right? Now, Parker Solar Probe will be four centimeters from the sun, right? So it's really, really close. And uh, so the protection shield that needs this is way, it has to be more powerful than the one that uh, any other space of it is. Okay, um, we have another question from Kathy. If a coronal ejection strikes the Parker Solar Probe, will it survive? Yes, yes it will. Actually, it's a very good question and one of the things that, yeah, very important question. So, uh, there is one thing, like what heats up the, the shield, or you need to protect it from radiation, right? Now, the, the ambient plasma where the Parker Solar Probe will be flying to, right, that plasma is at million degrees, right? So how come the spacecraft being immersed in a million degrees not burn, or like what if a, a, a very hot ejection comes through it and will it impact it? Because it's also hot, it's hot material going to the spacecraft. Well, it turns out that it, it, it is the answer to that question relates to our intuitive notion of temperature and heat, right? Yes, high temperature is a requirement to convey a lot of heat, right? But the, the how fast you can convey that heat uh, depends on what is uh, in between you and that thing. For instance, let's say, let's make this a very intuitive example uh, 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 with household items. Right? Let's take water boiling. Water boiling at 100 degrees, right, Celsius? You have it boiling, right, 100 degrees. Will you put your hand inside the boiling water? No, right, because you will immediately burn. Uh, now, now make the oven and set it to 100 degrees, right? And wait until it's 100. You can put your hand in the oven and hold it there for a, a little while, longer than if you put it in water. And the reason is because water is much, much denser and, and has a cap uh, the capacity to transfer heat quickly. Whereas when you put your hand in the oven, right, there is less hot particles in your hand conveying that heat to your hand. Right? Something like that happens uh, when solar probe is moving through the plasma. The plasma has so low density that even if it's so hot, it doesn't uh, transfer heat efficiently to the spectrum and then it will survive. So actually, uh, uh, we're looking forward to see measurements from ejection. 
are there instruments specifically on board uh, to kind of for any uh, like that would be tested um, during these ejections? If it's especially if it's a direct hit to the uh, the probe. Uh, the, let me take on the question. So the the the, the Pesto has four main instruments. Uh, four main instruments for different purposes. Uh, uh, a plasma always has an electric and magnetic field. So then it has this uh, one set of instruments, one suite of instruments called field because it's measuring the field. Then it has another suite that measures uh, the plasma itself, the particles that are coming toward the space, right? So then it's collecting the particles and analyzing them. And then that's the suite, it's called suite. Uh, it's an acronym. And then uh, there is the images, just taking uh, white light images, and then there is instrument for uh, measuring energetic particles. And uh, so the four instruments combined will give us um, enough information to understand various properties of the of the of the wing or, or, or the plasma, like coronal mass ejection. So with that, you can get a complete picture, or more or less complete picture of, of what you want. Right? So. Anything that you can, the, the, that is of interest uh, is, is, is there in the instrument to measure. All right. The, um, I do want to say, don't try the experiment of putting your hand in boiling water or in a hot oven. <laughs> don't do that. I, yeah. I just made it because intuitively, you know, right, that yeah. it's not a good idea to put a hand in a, in a, also in the oven, it's also not a good idea. But intuitively, you can imagine because when you are baking, right, you put your hands inside the oven to take something out, right? You don't burn by that, right? But you burn if you touch a handle that is hot, right, because you are directly touching. But if you are putting your hand, right, there is air in between you, and that's what transfers the heat, and, and, and it transfers it slower. You can still burn, but it's a slower process. All right, so it looks like um, that's pretty much all the questions we have for now. Uh, I want to thank you again for giving us this great talk and learning more about the sun and how we're exploring and, and testing the sun. Actually, I do have one more question. How big are the rooms or the buildings that house these supercomputers that you use for your models? Yeah, they're big. I have been, uh, the ones I know, I am very, I like very much the computers that I show, they, most of them belong to the Argonne National Lab, which is near Chicago, in the south west of Chicago, I think. Uh, I visited a few times, and I was given a tour around. It's a huge facility. Like, but these uh, computers are customly designed for, for the government. Right? So these are funded by the government, and IBM, or Intel, different uh, companies, they, get, uh, they, they bid with the government, and then they get the contract, and then they build. These are just custom made computers. Like they can, they condense as many processes as they can in a region of, of space, uh, in a rack. It, it's mind blown. So you, I, I, I saw this um, rack. They, we have rack with drawers of this hard disk because this this contains terabytes, not not terabytes, terabytes of data, and uh, it's just mind blown. And uh, one of the things that I like a lot about the uh, Argon computer is because they're in Chicago. So they are normally always winning the best, uh, the greenest computers because the cooling systems that they use, they always uh, save energy during winter. The brutal winter of Chicago, right? They, they circulate either air or cool water to the winter, I mean, to the outside, and then they are able to lower the cost of, 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 of the operation of the computer. If you go behind the racks of this computer, it's like, it's like very, very hot, like, uh, like as if you are in, it's really like you are in a very hot summer day. And uh, so these, these computers, they require a lot of uh, cooling uh, energy. So you have to pay a lot of money just in electricity to cool it up, cool it down. And uh, one other thing is that uh, one time uh, I was uh, giving a, seeing a seminar where they did this massive run many years ago. And they actually put the bill of how much electricity they spent running the simulation, right? And when we're given this uh, access to this computer, they sometimes remind us that running this for one hour, they tell you what it costs. Right? And when you're burning one hour of computing time, you're burning tens of thousands of dollars. Right? So these are very, very powerful computers. And they are in a big facility. 
it's uh, interesting. We can kind of draw the parallels of, of keeping the Parker Solar Probe uh, protected from the, the sun and the radiation coming from the sun, but then also the, the computing that you use, you also kind of have to think about cooling those off too. Yeah. So, um, well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Perez. Thank you guys for um, joining us. Uh, I do want... Oh, uh, to do one last thing before you guys uh, log off, I'm going to be uh, sh sharing our observatory tour. So uh, I know at the beginning I didn't get to introduce myself um, or that got cut off. Uh, my name is Dr. Saida Caballero. I'm an assistant professor at Florida Tech. I'm also the observatory director of our on-campus observatory, the Olin observatory um, and so today we we you typically after these talks have a um, open house with our observatory and we, we set up telescopes and we look at things like tonight we could see the moon and Jupiter and Saturn are up so they're really great things to look through a telescope so unfortunately we can't share that with you but we do want to share our virtual observatory tour so I'm gonna go ahead and go to it so you can find this um, on our website and it's also linked um, in the description of the YouTube uh, video. So this is a view from a Google Street view of our observatory and so there's four scenes and so this is just the outside view and we have a, a closer view of the observatory um, and you there's a different uh, description so you guys are welcome to explore this on your own. Um, there's also narration that you can have. I'm not going to turn it on because we're having issues with the sound, but um, you can turn on the narration that kind of reads you, um, walks you through the, to uh, the tour. So uh, scene two takes us to what we, I call the observing deck. So this is where we mount our smaller telescopes. Um, and so we, you, there are different points of interest that, and it's described there. If you have the Google um, virtual reality glasses, um, <laughs> you can actually do this with those virtual reality, uh, virtual reality um, Google thing with your phone, so which is also pretty cool. So definitely come check it out. It's as best that we can offer. Um, to come visit our observatory and so the next scene um, shows you the control room where our computer that uh, controls the, the big telescope is located. Um, you can also learn more about how Florida Tech got uh, to have our, our large telescope. Um, and finally you can actually go into the dome where the 0.8 meter is located um, and learn a little bit more about that. So thank you again for joining us and uh, we'll see you in about a month. Um, again, hopefully we'll have the sound issues figured out by then. Thank you for your patience and, and thank you for your, your being such a great audience. See you next time.